started. Perfect. Okay. Well, thank you all so much for joining us this evening. My name is Colleen McGinn. I'm one of the directors of alumni engagement here in the Office of Alumni Relations at Fairfield University. And we are thrilled to have with us the team from the Domena Nicilius Library here on campus. We have Christina McGowan, who is the Dean of the Library and University Librarian, and Lisa Thornell, who is the Head of Library Outreach and Communication. And we're just thrilled to have them give this amazing presentation to us this evening. Just a few housekeeping items before we get started. Please do keep yourselves on mute during the presentation. It just helps remove background noise and distraction. There will be time to chime in at the end if you do so wish to. And also we recommend using speaker view on your Zoom to keep your focus on our two guest speakers. Um, but that is obviously up to you, whatever your preference is. At the end of the presentation, we will address the questions that were submitted during the registration process, and we'll try to get to as many of those as possible. So do stay tuned all the way, and hopefully we'll get a chance to answer your question. So with that, I will turn it over to Christina and Lisa. Thank you, Colleen. Really appreciate it. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us this evening. I'm Christina McGowan, Dean of the Library, and we're so happy to see so many of you. Uh, joining us tonight. So thank you for your interest in the Domena Nicilius Library. I'm very proud of all of the work our staff does here and I'm eager to share some of that with you. So we thought we'd start with a bit of fun. So the photo on the right was taken during this past December during finals week. And you can see here, this was, if you uh, recall, this is the main level. And um, it's, we had, we were opened 24 hours and during finals week, we had 8,230 visits. The photo on the left was shared. If you are, um, you follow us on Instagram, it was shared. And it's also um, on the main level. And we're gonna do a little poll and Lisa is gonna do that for us. And if you don't mind giving it a try and uh, seeing what year you think it is. So you can see here, we've got 1980, 1976, 1987, and 1969. Almost everybody's answered, just give it another couple seconds. Okay, I think we got everybody. You see and ending the poll or do you want me to? Yeah. Okay. And did you do it? You share yeah. you shared it? Mm -hmm. Okay. And yeah. the answer is actually 1987. So actually 36% of you got it right. So I'm going to Lisa, will you stop sharing that for me? That's okay. Thank you so much. Okay. Um, actually, it is on the main level. So it's on the main level in 1987. And right now, um, this is, it has been converted to group study rooms. So it's a lovely place where a lot of our students work. Hey, okay, we're going to do another one. This is also from, this is um, from the archives too, just like the last one. And Lisa, do you want to put up that uh, quiz for us? Okay. So where is this family posing on campus? <laughs> I, I think we got this one, Lisa. I think you're gonna end okay. it. <laughs> All right, we're gonna end this poll. <laughs> okay, we're going to end the poll. You are absolutely right. 100% of you got it right. It is Bellarmine Hall. That's great. That's awesome. So yes, it's Bellarmine Hall. The family actually was uh, the Lasher family. And the two estates, the Lasher family's estate was called Hearthstone Hall. And the Jennings family estate was known as Malins, which is McAuliffe. Uh, those two estates were available for purchase at around the same time. And the Jesuits purchased just them in 1941. It's a beautiful photo. I love this photo. So go on to the next one. 
Okay, so this is our this is our one more bit of university history for uh, for tonight, or at least for this little quiz here. So we've got, and hopefully you can see this, which musical artist did not perform at Fairfield University? This one is not as obvious as, as the <laughs> Bellarmine one. Yeah, a little harder. We almost there, Lisa? Yep, I think we're there. So I'll okay. Share that. Thank you. Wow. Okay. You all are very good. You're absolutely right. It was 54% of you said the doors, and that is correct. The doors were scheduled to play uh, on at Fairfield U in May 1970, but the show was canceled by the university administration in conjunction with the town of Fairfield. Jim Morrison of the Doors at the time had been arrested twice, once in New Haven and also in uh, Florida for lewd behavior. And the reason given for canceling the show allegedly revolved around concerns about rioting and crowd misconduct. In the archives, we have two tickets that were printed and were never used. So, let me show you this picture. This is who... These were the folks who did come. We have um, a lovely photo from um, the archives with Billy Joel and Father Kelly. That's in 1991. He was the, Billy Joel was the commencement speaker and he received an honorary doctorate. He also performed in, on campus in the late 1970s. And then we have Melissa Etheridge in the middle. And Melissa Etheridge performed as part of the Dogwood Festival in 1990. And uh, funny enough, um, the Indigo Girls, which all of a sudden we're hearing all about with um, Barbie, they um, were her opening act. And then finally on the right-hand side, we have Tony Bennett. And Tony Bennett was at the Winter Carnival in 1963 and tickets were $3 for the concert in the gym. So I could personally spend, I'm a former, I'm a history, it was history major, my undergraduate, I could personally spend all of my time talking about archives related things, but I, pro I should move on. What I'm hoping is at the end, we might have the opportunity to share. Um, we'll, Lisa will be opening up. Um, we'll be asking folks to share their thoughts and their memories about whether it's the library or um, the university. So we'll do that. Uh, We'll hopefully do that a little bit later. So I'm gonna just uh, spend a little bit of time on what we are doing now. So, so uh, this is um, what we've been, some of what we've been up to. The library unveiled its strategic plan in the spring of 2022. And the plan includes a revised mission statement and articulation of the values that inspire our work and our ambitions and goals that guide our work over the next several years. So you can see on the screen is our mission, and I'll read just a little bit about of it. So the library empowers the members of our community in the development of their whole person, including their intellectual, psychological, spiritual, and professional exploration, their development as critical thinkers, their endeavors as knowledge creators, and their quest for lifelong fulfillment. So we strive um, and I'll just mention what we do, what we strive to is we engage our community in to develop curiosity, creativity, reasoning, and exploring new viewpoints, providing equitable access to collections, advancing those ideals of academic integrity, information literacy, and the ethical use of information. We showed you a little bit about preserving university history, and we'll be happy to share some of um, our links regarding Later on, when you get uh, a recording of this, we'll share some of the links, which will show you ways of how you can engage with university history. And then also cultivating an inclusive and welcoming physical and digital space and preparing our community to be socially responsible citizens. So how are we doing this? What are our, our ambitions? We have, I don't have time to go over the six goals of the strategic plan, but I want to cover two of our ambitions and their institutional memory and the modern academic library. So the university archives, which is housed in the library, preserves and provides access 
to the institutional memory of the university by documenting its past and present in both physical and digital formats. One of the library's objectives is to ensure, and you can see here that space and staffing for the archives is sufficient to support a growing university. In late 2022, the library developed a space plan and we have held meetings with key university personnel to advocate for moving the expansion and the renovation of the university archives forward. We have another meeting actually on February 29th. So this is ongoing. Archive staff will continue to make physical collections more accessible online via the development of finding aids and through digitization projects. We are so very thankful to receive a generous donation that has made, um, we just actually are receiving it right now. We are digitizing yearbooks, university magazines, um, student newspapers, and much, much more. So we're very, very thankful. Um, please be on the lookout uh, this summer for a new book about Fairfield University. It's called Success on the Sound, A History of Fairfield University. It's written by Elise Baczynski, who is the university archivist, and two retired professors, Paul Lakeland and Kurt Schlichting. So, um, and I, what, I had a meeting today. We are planning to have some alumni events um, that just started the planning now, but we'll, uh, you'll hear a lot more information about this book in the upcoming months. Our other ambition here is modern academic library. And you can see here, we want to reinvent the library as the intellectual heart of the university, integral to student experience, collaboration, and the scholarly pursuits of our community. And I'm just gonna go through how we are doing this. So library is service. So the modern academic library is defined by the relationships it forms across campus and its contributions to the academic success of our students and faculty. And one way that we do this is through our institutional repository system called Digital Commons at Fairfield. And again, we will be sharing this um, in, an, in an email, the link to this. This, um, the purpose of Digital Commons at Fairfield is to increase the visibility of the university scholarship, maximizing its research impact and providing worldwide access. And if you look on this um, photo on the left-hand side, it's basically, it's a screenshot of the readership map. And this was from last Thursday. So you can see here the number of papers that are in here. And what's amazing is the amount of downloads, 862,952 downloads in the past year from this, which is university scholarship. We've got 136,000 plus downloads. In one day on Thursday, we got 398 downloads. You can see at this point, at this time, point in time, this is who is where around the world people were reading uh, faculty, staff, and student research. And then you can see some of you may be familiar with Philip Eliasov. At this moment, when I took the screenshot, somebody from Greece was reading uh, his work. So it's a really cool thing. It's really, it's fun. You have, all have access to it. Um, so we'll make sure that you have um, this ability to take a look at this. On the right is our library research prize. This is an event. These are our library research prize winners from 2023. It's a wonderful event. It's open to the public. Anybody is welcome to come. Their stories are incredible. The work that they do is really significant. Uh, this is our graduate student uh, winner of last year. He's gone on to RPI to get a doctorate in biomedical engineering. And our undergraduate winner here on the right was a double major in international business and business analytics and is currently getting her MBA at Dolan. The next thing is Library's Place, um, which you might be a little bit more familiar with. Um, the modern academic library fosters community, collaboration, and intellectual discourse, both in the building and online. So if you haven't been here uh, in a while, we've had since the fall of 2019, we've had the Academic Commons open in the library. And that is our one-stop shop on the main level for all academic support services. Uh, this is our Academic Commons trick-or-treat event. 
And at that time, we had 450 students were in attendance. So show it, and um, it was unbelievable. We were, had no idea. I think we probably got twice the amount of students we thought we were gonna get looking at Lisa Shea Grace. Um, this photo in the middle, is a student who is sitting in a really comfortable brand new chair um, that we got about two weeks ago. And um, this is all thanks to the furniture upgrades that you'll see on the upper level and also on the main level are thanks to generous donors. Um, we, uh, we really wanna make sure that this, the library is established as a home away from home. We do that through our building upkeep and our technology upgrades. And basically, who doesn't love a cute dog photo? Um, we offer Wellness Wednesdays every week where a therapy co uh, dog comes to visit for our students. And then we go, finally, library's idea. So as the modern academic library, we advance a culture of exploration and shared learning through collaboration, programming, collections, and services. So just last week, we celebrated Frederick Douglass's birthday, and that was on Valentine's Day. And um, we had a Douglass Day transcribathon. Um, on Friday, very excited to say there's going to be a Fairfield News article about the event. So check that out. You will be seeing that soon. Um, the photo on the top right is a gathering of students, staff, and faculty to celebrate the end of our summer reading challenge. We offer reading challenges in the summer and winter for our community to gather together in conversation, both online and in person, and to motivate one another to read. And if you like reading and are looking for some suggestions, please check out the Stags Read Guide, which we will also be sharing, to, sharing with you. The library has organized trips to places like the Morgan Library and the Beinecke and many others and there have been some conversation about offering these opportunities to alums. So if you are interested, you'll have my contact information. If this something interests you, we want to hear from you because these trips are really fun. And it's just something recently we thought like that alums may also uh, like something like this. And then the photo in the lower right is from our Stag Share Stories event. Some uh, newer uh, alums may know it as the Human Library. So this event, which I think it's uh, Stag Share so Stories, this might be Lisa, the second or third year of this? Yep, second year. Second year, okay. So this event and alumni have been storytellers and this event offers an opportunity for a community to connect and promote a culture of understanding empathy and appreciation of the university's diverse community. And if you follow us on social media, you'll see the various programming we offer. Like tomorrow, we have a jazz concert. Some of you may know Brian Torf. We have the Brian Torf group who is gonna be performing tomorrow night in the auditorium as part of um, his performance is gonna go along with the exhibit in the library called Seize the Music, or seize the beat, excuse me, music and race in the deep south. Lisa, that's at 7 p.m. tomorrow? Yes, that's 7 p.m. And if you are in the area, feel free to come. There's no tickets, there's no charge. So this is um, our Let's Keep in Touch. We have a newsletter. It comes out twice a year beyond the stacks. Uh, QR code is right here. You can follow us on Instagram. Here is my contact information. And now it's an opportunity, which we uh, mentioned, is we want to hear, um, I'm going to turn it over to Lisa uh, Thornell, my colleague, to assist with the Q&A. And um, then we're going to open it up um, you know, to all of you. So thank you again. Lisa, do you want me to stop the share so I can see? Um, unless you want to leave it up maybe for another minute in case anybody needs to jot down your email. Um, or scan the QR code for our recent issue of Beyond the Stacks newsletter. Um, so maybe while, while everyone's kind of thinking through if there's any questions you have, we'll start with a couple from the, um, the sign up page that people submitted. Um, there right. were several, um, several really, really great questions here, so we'll get to a few. One of them, Christina, that I was hoping you could address is um, 
someone asking if you could comment on the connection between the Nicilius family and Fairfield University and as well as the Demenon family. So the two names in our library name. Right. So I was fortunate to get this beforehand. Um, so I contacted Elise Bachinsky, who's our university archivist. And she gave me a very, very comprehensive response. Um, it's definitely worth reading the whole thing. Um, if folks are interested, I'm going to send it directly to the individual. But if you are also interested, just drop me a line. Um, like I said, my email is there. I'll just tell you a little bit about um, that is the Nicilius Library was founded in part through the support of Gustav and Dagmar Nicilius, whose friendship with the fifth university president, Reverend William C. McInnes SJ, prompted their generosity to the university. So Gustav Nicilius was a well-known industrialist from Stanford who received the Swedish government Swedish American of 1971 award. And we actually have a beautiful painting of him um, on the third floor next to one of our group study rooms in 324. And um, Joseph uh, Demena, and actually we got this information from Barbara Kiernan's article in Fairfield Now, which is as well as other uh, archival resources, as somebody in the questions and the comments gave Barbara Kiernan a shout out. So if you're on this call, um, I saw that. And then Demena, Joseph Demena, was a 1980 graduate of Fairfield University who became managing director of Zwieg Domena Associates, a New York financial services firm. In 1998, he gave five million to the university for the renovation and the expansion of the library building. At the time, this was the largest uh, gift that Fairfield University had uh, received from an alumnus. Groundbreaking occurred in 1999, and Joseph Domena was at the in, uh, dedication ceremony held on October 4th, 2001. Great. And then we got several questions, Christina, about um, alumni access to library resources and yeah. just or how they can use the building as well. So just wanting to know how they can still um, sure. engage with us. Sure. Thanks, Lisa. Okay, so all of our current online databases and e-journals, which we have many, many of, are available uh, to currently affiliated faculty, students, and staff, and that's due to licenses. Um, you're right, there are, somebody had said, hey, some universities do offer them, and those universities are usually older and larger institutions, and they're able to grant access to some, only a small amount of e-resources to alums because they have just more resources um, like endowment funds because they're subscriptions. So as we grow our philanthropic support and our endowment continues to grow, I'm hopeful that we're gonna get to that place because uh, these, these alums were not the first people to ask us for that. Um, if you are local, you can come on in and you can use, you can check out materials, you can use any of our databases, any of our resources, and we do have an alumni website, which again, we will make sure to include in the email. So there are resources available for you, but I know that there are some folks who get very used to some of the resources that we have, and um, they're disappointed that um, they're not able to access them. Them and, and we hear you. We, we'd love to be able to do that, but um, I'm, I, I hear you. I'm listening to you about that. So thank you for that question. Um, okay, then we have um, at least one person's name that I recognize who was a student worker, but someone had asked, um, I used to work at the library. Do students still do shelf reading? And you might want to explain <laughs> what shelf reading is. <laughs> oh, goodness. It's shelf reading is basically, I haven't, I haven't had to do that in a while, but I did that for many years. It's to make sure that the books are in order, you know, so that they're able to be found. So it's really, really important. Um, and yes, we, st <laughs> we still do it. Um, some students still do shelf reading, um, especially when they're new, newly hired. Um, it's a good way to practice those Library of Congress uh, call numbers. Um, when they're on the staff a little longer, we do have something now called the inventory system where we use technology, um, and that, but that requires a higher level of detail. Um, our student workers um, work at the, it's now called the Library Services and Information Desk. Um, they are first point of contact. They're 
we they're awesome. They become part of our family. Can actually see two profiles of um, student uh, workers in our last uh, issue of Beyond the Stacks. They're uh, two graduate students who have who are with us for four years. They're amazing. They do things like our uh, social media accounts, um, outreach. We do a lot of tabling. They um, teach us study skill sessions. So they do a lot. They do the um, regular thing that you may be used to, but they also do quite a few other uh, responsibilities. So thanks for that. Um, do we have time for two more from this list, Christina? Yeah, sure. Yeah, okay. I want to um, make sure that folks have, have time if they have questions, but yeah. Um, there was another one just wanting a uh, question about are there group study rooms, conference rooms, and do you have them for different subjects? Yeah, so we have... I'm not sure how many group study rooms, uh, close to 20 group study rooms. Um, some of them are actually for one or two uh, students because um, students ache for a place sometimes to have like concentrated time. And so those um, single double study rooms are really useful. Um, they can reserve them. Actually, alums also have the ability to uh, use their study rooms. Just thought about that. now. Um, they do not, unfortunately, they're not um, in subjects. Somebody said, are they aimed at specific subjects? But part of our academic commons renovation in 2019 brought in a whole bunch of different folks. And uh, like I said, on the main level, we have things like the Writing Center, the Science Center is brand new, the Math Center, uh, ITS, Office of Accessibility, but a lot of those areas provide, whether it's tutoring or they do provide some opportunity for studying in there, so. Okay, and the last one, I'll read it from here and then we'll open it up to yeah. everyone else. Um, it's just someone wanting to know more about the role of the library on the college campus. Yeah, no, I think, and this is a good question. It says, um, with almost universal online uh, capacity, what is the uh, role of the library for the college um, population? And um, we started, I don't know how many years ago, five plus years ago, a student library advisory board. And they are such a great group of students um, every year. And uh, we have a different group and we listen to them and we learn a lot from them. Um, so uh, that's one way that we make sure that we stay connected. When we think of library's place, that's an obvious thing. Like I said, students hunger for a place to get away from their residences, to find quiet or collaborate. We also offer collections like e-journals, streaming videos, books, e-books that are, and, and some of those, as you know, are behind a paywall. And so they can't get, they won't be able to get to them any other way. So that, that's one way. Um, we also have, you know, you know, as we grow and graduate, there's just even more our graduate students, you, you know, need this. And our faculty, who are such incredible uh, researchers, um, also need these resources. Uh, new this fall is our study skills programming. We basically brought that in as academic support and retention was reorganized. So we do many different study skills programming, which we know like time management students hunger for. We have we have that Sunday evenings, we do note taking. I'm trying to think of Lisa. Lisa is in charge of all those. She knows <laughs> all of the different study skills programming we do, but it's um, uh, that's one of the new things that we do and how we uh, make sure we make sure that students are successful here. Great. And I, Christina, I just want to mention, we have one of our student library advisory board members that registered tonight, which is exciting. So she's on the oh, call. That's great. So, yeah. Um, okay. So let's, let's open it up and see if, does anybody have a question? Please just use the, um, you can raise your hand feature or if your camera is already on, you can raise your physical hand and I will, I will call on you. Um, okay. Oh, I see someone already. Um, Jeremiah, what's your question? Hi. Uh... Oh, oh, Jeremiah, we're having you. a hard time hearing you. Uh, can you hear me now better? Yes. Okay, yes. Great. Uh, two quick questions. One is, what percentage of the university's budget is dedicated to the library? And second, what role is generative AI or any uh, machine learning playing in the 
uh, libraries future present and future uh, in terms of enhancing learning opportunities so um oh lisa am i answering that yeah go ahead but, yeah. okay there was echo percentage of budget that would be that's probably something i need to know from acrl uh, jeremiah will say not nearly enough <laughs> <laughs> That being, I, I do not have the exact answer. I am very happy, though, to say that the provost has been a big supporter of the library. And, and if some of you know about the publishing industry, the increases can be pretty significant year over year. And so we have been very fortunate that we have been able to keep up with inflation regarding that. So we've been able to, when new student, when new programs come, when all the new graduate programs come, we have been able to uh, get what is needed to support those. But I don't have that exact number in terms of percentage, but that's a really excellent question. Um, regarding AI, uh, the library has, um, it's, it's funny because the library has been, I would say, a leader or co-leader regarding that in terms of we just offered an AI and research, research workshop for our students, AI and research workshop for our faculty uh, as uh, with alongside the Center for Academic Excellence. We have incorporated AI into our citation guides and to make sure that our staff are knowledgeable and you know it's all around us. We have to, we can't hide it hide it. So we've got a brown bag lot coming up in a week or two to just make sure that we're continuing the conversation. So that's where we are now. We know Scopus, which is one of our newest database, has AI beta in there. Some of our, you know, we're all using the various AI tools. Um, I utilize the AI tools, but that's kind of where we are right now. We're teaching like in, as part of our information literacy class, but we're making sure that we talk to the faculty first when when we're doing that to see what their level of you know familiarity or comfort is in sharing these things so i hope i answered your question jeremiah you did and if i could just i hate to hog the uh microphone but one last quick thing is your interactions with other college and university librarians uh, around the world and yes. in connecticut how do i interact with them Yes. Um, I am a, I am the chair of the Council of Connecticut Academic Library Directors. It's for it's my third year on right. there. <laughs> my third year as chair. I'm very excited for somebody else to to, to take the reins of that. So I um so I I can tell you I meet with them on a regular basis. I just was talking to the uh, university librarian at Fordham. The AJCU librarians are very a very close group. We actually share an uh, annual report, just found out uh, ours are due in April, where we learn from each other. Um, we meet on an annual basis. And um, then I share all of those reports with our staff and we make sure, hey, is there something they're doing that's interesting? What are we doing? I presented at the conference on our strategic plan last year. So yeah, it's, um. You know, as librarians, you just, you know, I, that's what we do. We share and we learn. We learn. Great. Each other. Thank you. Can I, can I add something to that, Christina? Yeah, of course. Um, so the, the AJCU, right, the collective of all the Jesuit universities, we um, we all work together as librarians to make sure we can offer 24-7 uh, research help to students. And so I see, Paul, I see you shaking your head over there. You know about it. Paul Hovey. Um, so there's a chat box on our homepage. Students can ask about research help about um, you know brainstorming keywords. I can't open this link. How do I cite this? Anything they want and they get responses from a real person 24 seven because we work with these other Jesuit librarians. So if it's after 10 p.m. and our staff, uh, our, our research librarians aren't you know there, we're home sleeping. Um, it's librarians on the West Coast at another Jesuit university responding. And we do the same for them. We work as a team to provide that service. Just thought that'd be fun for you all to hear. <laughs> Does anyone else have um, a question? Any other hands? Um, when I worked there, they had micro microfiche, <clears throat> and did did you digitize all that when things were converted? 
Karen, there's there's a bit left. We do have some microfiche and microfilm, and um, but not as much. I'm not sure when you were here, but probably not as many as uh, we had before. A lot of the things, you know, a lot of e-journals. I mean, a lot of journals have just gone to electronic. So, so much of what we subscribe to now is electronic. So we had the New York Times. I think we might still, maybe we don't. We had the New York Times like in microfilm. Now we have it all, we have it all to 1851, but it's all we subscribe to. It's all electronic. So, I, I, um, I, yeah, sorry, Karen. Yeah. I was going to say, I, were, I knew that picture because I worked there from 85 to 89. So I was like, I knew, I knew 87, but yeah, <laughs> you have to come in shelved the books the medical students didn't know how to alphabetize and the books were this big and they were very on those tie on, on the way top and i'm sure i had to but that was that was difficult but i was involved with interlibrary loans like i worked there four years and so my boss like took me in the back let me work in her office in the back after i shelved do you still have a pretty robust interlibrary loan we have yeah so interlibrary loan is basically so what karen's talking about it's um it's, if we don't have it, we get it for you, you know, so, and, but now it's all for the, not books as much books. We still, because of copyright, we still right now have to deal with the mail, but everything else, journal articles, it's all, it's all, um, we're sharing it, but we're sharing it digitally. So, and we have a student, a couple of students who work in interlibrary services and they're huge. We also offer uh, document delivery too. So that's something that also these students do. So like, let's say um, you are a student you're, um, or a faculty member who doesn't work at the Fairfield University campus or they're remote. We basically will digitize what is needed and we will send it to you. And if we can't digitize it, we will email it to you. Uh, same for faculty and staff. We have students who uh, deliver the materials. So we've got faculty who say, yeah, I, I don't want to come. Um, I would really prefer to have the book um, brought to, you know, sent to me, or could you digitize this and send it off? We we offer that too. And that's also part of interlibrary services and document delivery, Karen. So that's the, yeah. Thank okay. you for working there for four years. <laughs> well, I'll tell you, they, at that time, they had one big, one really large computer, and you'd have to pay to get an internet search. I can't remember how much it cost, but that was in the back, too. You have to make an appointment and do that. Yeah. Karen, you yeah. and I were there at the same what? time. Oh, Rochelle, yeah. you were there, too? I was there from 86 to 90. So that's oh, that's funny. fantastic. Overlap at some point, but I did mostly circulation and shelving books. That's awesome. Um, one thing that you may, the microform room, we repurposed it to after um, in 2020. Like I said, we still have some microforms, but now it's such a beautiful student study space. It's bright. It's very well lit. It's, it's, it's lovely. So the students constantly use it. It's a great space. Christina, we have another hand up. Um, yeah. Jenny. Hey there. Um, I would ask, what area or of study or collection would you say our library would be known for? Yeah. Um, you know, for so long, I mean, collection is so, I think what we really do when we think about our mission as a Jesuit, like Catholic university, we always make sure. So if that's something that's kind of unique, and if we're going to make sure to get a special collection, that's kind of an area of focus that we we go to. So that would be what we would be known for. Um, you know, I think all of the other things, we make sure that we are supporting the curriculum uh, and the faculty research. I mean, we've got a big, you know, in terms of business and our uh, nursing and our health studies, yeah. Anything else, Lisa, you can think of? I mean, you know, well, I would say them all, but but Jesuit Catholic is really important to us. Yeah. Well, and also, I mean, yeah, we exactly what you were saying about supporting the curriculum is priority, but we also um, provide a leisure reading collection. And I would say even since COVID, I've noticed just it seems to be more and more students are doing or 
of reading for pleasure and that they're finding time to do it. And so on um, that collection on our main level, that's in a very visible spot is in constant use. Um, and students are very passionate about telling us what they want to see represented there. And we listen and we'll, and we'll order those. So um, for me personally, that's been a fun collection to see that um, get used even more, the print books as well. <laughs> That's that collection actually came about because um, a student of ours asked for it too. That was something that was really a student focused on. We have a student book club actually that's um, on campus that's relatively new, and Lisa is um, the advisor, and they meet in the library, and they're also part of the reading challenges. Jenny, you had another question. Um, just a comment. Yeah. Um, so my husband and I are both graduates, as uh, was her daughter. And we were on campus for our 45th reunion last June. And I can tell you a number of people were disappointed that we couldn't enter the library. So when was, in when was that, Jenny? That was, was during reunion? Yeah. Oh, so, that's you know, everybody was like, oh, let's go walk, you know, leave the truck, you know, uh, whatever yeah. festival that was on the lacrosse field. And let's go see the library because it didn't look like that when we were there in 1974 to 1978 yeah. and you get all the way down the hill and it's like boom doors are locked so you know maybe incorporate something we toured the gym we toured the campus center but you know maybe add that to the reunion schedule I That's a great idea I agree I it's at one point we weren't open during commencement and actually I yeah I'm not sure why we could not be open for for a time. So thank you for that suggestion. So that was during re on the reunion. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Yes. It Thanks. was uh, coming back up this weekend for a basketball game. Don't know if I'll get to the library <laughs> during that, but you know, we'll, we'll try. Okay. Thank you, Jenny. That's great. Do we have any other questions? Questions are reminiscent, like I, you know, I think we were talking about that too, memories of the university or um, or um, the library. Happy to hear well, them. I, I, <laughs> if I could, if I could just give you one uh, memory, I might be one of the oldest living graduates here. So in the 1960s, uh, there was, when you went to the library, which was then at Canisius Hall in the first floor, uh, there was a cage with the index of forbidden books the roman index and you had to get permission to go in there to take a book out i don't know whether you have that today but i doubt it jeremiah we share that story with our students and we have some of those books in the archives and special collections um that we share they have an x on them so we do not have the cage anymore <laughs> but we do. But and, we do and they, have and some... they, It was not that they were salacious. It's that their philosophy yes. or theology was uh, might corrupt the student body. This, our students love that story, and they also um, like the story. We were trying to get um, some alums to share their story about when they, I guess, broke open the cage and, oh. and made yes and took the books out of the cage and, and put them uh, at various different places. So it was an act of, yeah, um, we have some great stories about that in the archives. But that is For, kind of one forbidden of fruit is always attractive, isn't it? <laughs> yes, yes. I think there was a New York Times article at the time about that yes, as well. Yes, there was. It made it to the New York <laughs> Times. Yep. Um, Maria has her hand up, too. Hi, um, my question is, it seems you guys are doing so much, which is really cool. Um, I was wondering, do you feel that you are at, at adequate staffing levels or um, would you say it's more about um, the organization, like teamwork? Um, like you said, you had a an advisory council even for students. Um, so I'm wondering, like, how are you able to do everything you do with, is it like the staffing levels or the collaboration? So I'm always going to, you know, I'm asking for a scholarly communication librarian. Um, and because um, the university is now a doctoral professional um, and with our digital commons and the importance of research, that, uh, that position is key. 
I also, if you notice when I talked about institutional memory, I really think there's so much potential in the archives. And that is an area I see of growth. You know, we're a fairly young university. There's so much. We we just don't have we don't have this uh we don't have the staff in that area. We did get as much as I would like to see. We did get a part-time um archives librarian this year. So that is a new position that we received. That was part-time. And that individual is helping in a major way right now. So Maria, we're we're um you know, the university is doing really great. And um, I know how fortunate we are as a university. I also know how fortunate we are in terms of the library, in terms of the budget and staffing. But as we continue to grow, yeah, there um, we certainly, there are a couple areas that I'm really interested in. Like I said, scholarly communication archives are the, the ones that I'm, uh, I think we really could use more staffing. So thanks for that question. Um, anybody else with a memory they'd like to share or a question or a comment, anything? Uh, Brittany. Hi, Brittany. I'll chime in. Hi. Um, so, hi, Christina. Um, hi, Brittany. Um, so, I just wanted to thank you for putting this together. It, it was really nice to see the poll and get us all engaged and to learn some fun facts and be able to go tell my parents that Billy Joel performed at Fairfield and has a doctorate. Um, so that's one thing that'll stick with me. And then Lisa, I think it's fantastic that you're doing a book club with the students. Um, it's something that can be so powerful and a practice that they can keep with them. So I really just wanted to thank you all for investing in the growth of the library, thinking strategically about how you're going to stay on top of the trends and leading AI and influencing the faculty and staff, because I know how tremendous it was for my Fairfield experience. And um, I'm very excited to see how you'll continue to influence the the next generation of STAG. So great work and excited to see the progress. Thank you, Brittany. And Brittany worked for us for four years in the library. And I, did. I cried like I cried like ridiculously at graduation when she <laughs> graduated. <laughs> well, I still keep in touch with my boss. She was Amazing. Amazing. She wasn't just a boss, she was a friend. But mm. we used to have for my 19th birthday. My friends rented Gone with the Wind. We rented a room at the bottom of the library in the, in the basement of the library. And we watched the movie and we, we took in some undercover popcorn. And that was like, that was my birthday celebration. So it was, you know, it brings back, I always had an affinity for the library and it was actually, the shelving was very good for me in that it helped me learn the location of everything and all of, the materials of the library. So it wasn't just like, a, oh, they're making the, the kids do that. It was actually, it helped me to write my papers. And, and then I, I knew exactly where to where to find stuff. But I got to say, everybody at the library, I worked with Barbara. I, I worked with two Nancy's. They were fabulous. You know, they, um, yeah, the staff is really great. They were always very good to the students and, and, and to the general public who they helped as well. You know, my boss was, you know, but the one of my bosses was the first line when you came in, and she had she helped. Um, so it was really great, a good experience. Uh, when I retire, I'm definitely going to be volunteering in a library. That's for sure. Thank you, Karen. That's great. Love the stories. Paul has a question. Paul Richards, yeah. Paul, you're on mute right now. I'm still muted. Let's see if we can. Can we try to unmute him? I don't think I have. Colleen might have to. I'm, I can only ask him to unmute. Oh, wait a second. Yeah. Was off for a second. I think one more time, Paul. There you go. Yay. Hello. Hi. Uh, regarding the doors, uh, this was 1969, 1970. They were approved to be on campus. But Father McGinnis found out who the doors were, <laughs> and it got next. But they were all scheduled. Yep, they were. Oh, <laughs> I know. Look at Jenny crying. Do you, I did know. you know that? <laughs> oh, yeah. Yep. It's yes. Yeah, they were. I mean, we had the tickets and every, we had the tickets. It was all ready to go. It was all it ready was all to set. go. 
Yep, is all ready. I think it's yeah. and uh, too bad our archivist isn't here right now, but I think that one of the yearbooks, it's a broken record in the yearbook because the person was so angry. I think uh, I didn't I think Jim Fitzpatrick <laughs> was so angry that it was canceled. Yeah. I mean, the tickets are just like to see that. Um, yeah. yeah. Were you here? Were you there, Paul, at the time? I I I was actually in Europe at the time, but I okay. uh, had seen I had seen them uh, the year before. Okay. Down at Forest Hills. Oh, lucky. They were they were the opening act for Simon and Garfunkel, if you can believe that. <laughs> That's fantastic. <laughs> Oh, Jenny has her hand up. I uh, just want to let you know, Bruce Springsteen was supposed to be at Fairfield. I think it was my freshman year with Electric Hot Tuna uh, in the gym. <clears throat> and he canceled because he had a sore throat. And at that point, no one knew who he was. So nobody really cared. <laughs> it's fantastic. <laughs> well, I, as I said, Valley. there's so many stories. There's so many wonderful stories of this kind of stuff. I, so, I, I mean, like, yeah. I was lucky enough to be at the commencement. My brother-in-law graduated when Billy Joel was the speaker. He was incredible. But for my own, I had Leonard Bernstein. He was fabulous. I mean, good speakers. Well, John Sherman, I see your hand up. Yes, and uh, the person or the group who took over for Bruce Springsteen in Hot Tuna was none other than Frankie Valley in the Four Seasons. <laughs> it turned out to be a pretty good concert. But we were waiting for Bruce. All the guys from Jersey and New York knew about Bruce, and we were looking forward to that. That's awesome. So, so well, we're, uh, not got, to, not, oh, not sorry, to, Jeremiah. Yep, we've got five re, minutes. Not to return to uh, a subject that's too serious, but since you're in co contact with all the Jesuit colleges and yes. universities, uh, how do we stack up, if you stack up with your stacks, how do we stack up vis-a-vis -vis, uh, some of the older institutions, the Boston Colleges, uh, the, the Holy Crosses, the Georgetowns, and so forth? Uh, where yeah. where would we stand in terms of uh, library, uh, if we're being raided by uh, that horrible U.S. News World Report or something, how would our library stack up? In the yeah, middle, I mean, I mean we're yeah. a young university, so it's, we are, we are. Yeah. I mean, we do. If you look at us um, against BC and Georgetown, um, the staffing and the budget, um, you know, that's and, and even the programs. Some of the programs, and it, it, we're just different. We're young, as you said, but. I feel like we're doing, I mean, when I look at Fordham, my daughter goes to Fordham um, and where I feel like we excel. And I think, you know, I feel pretty, I feel really good about our collections budget. I think it's strong. And it's, I would say the last few years, you know, it's really continuing strong. I think where we really shine is our um, student support, our student services like our student academic support, our student programming. Um, we we really care for them in terms of like in wellness, like study skills. And our, so, I mean, I don't want to, I don't want to um, dismiss other universities, um, but we are certainly, if we're in the middle or the higher middle, I would say. Great. Thank you. You guys have puppies on Wednesdays. I think you beat everyone. <laughs> <laughs> we do. And we have free coffee and snacks um, after midnight during finals when we're 24 hours. Yep, we do. Yeah. All the fun stuff that goes on then. Yeah, so we have another minute. So I don't know if anybody else has another question, comment, or memory to share before we head out. Um, John. I have uh, one memory during finals, um, in the height of finals. There was an excavator, there was a fad going on. It's called streaking. Has that ever occurred at the Fairfield Library? <laughs> uh, the oh, I'm sure. I am sure it has, John. Many <laughs> interesting things happen in the library. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I um I was here one night working way too late, 10 or 11. And at the time, and there was this big like rave party, and they came to the desk 
to say that they were going to do it and they apologized beforehand really? and then the music was blasting and the and the dancing unfortunately a little bit of drinks were were flying too but at least they came to apologize and tell us before that this was happening. Oh, courteous. Yes. <laughs> um, well, I know we are at time and I really want to thank you. This was really fun. This is the first time we have done something uh, like this. I really enjoyed my time. I loved hearing some of your stories. Um, I told you we will be sharing a whole bunch of links. You have my contact information. Um, so please reach out. I've really enjoyed talking to you all and I hope you have um, a lovely evening. So thank you again. Thank you both thank so you. much. This is, this is really great. Oh, thank you, Karen. Thanks thank everybody for joining us. And Christine and Lisa Save the Date reunion is June 7th through 9th. So we'll work on making sure the library is open. <laughs> thank you, Colleen. Thank you all. Have a great night. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you.